Okay, by now most of you know that I will be out of work for another three weeks. To make my life more fun, my septic tank overflowed. 250 bucks a pump. To stretch my legs, I took a walk around the neighborhood. I'll be honest, 75% of my neighbors are jerks, but the few I like, I'll stop and talk to. I was telling my friend Brian about my septic problems and learned that he's been in the business for 11 years. It's not your tank. I'll bet you six beers that your filter is clogged. I didn't know septic tanks had filters, but they do. Brian explained what I needed to do and then spent 20 minutes telling me about what he was finding in septic systems. One job that particularly stood out was where he took the lid off to check the filter and found that it was full of almost 30 condoms. He said he was making a little joke about how maybe the owner should throw them in the trash from now on when he suddenly noticed how pale the guy was. Apparently, in their 18 years together, they had never once used a condom. How did that turn out? Hell, I don't know. I cleaned the filter and he wrote me a check. Really, he was wearing a pair of kitchen gloves when I left and he put all the rubbers in a little bucket. And we left. Well, isn't this wonderful, I thought, looking down. Beth came screaming into the living room saying the toilet had exploded. Apparently it had. Knowing full well that Beth wouldn't do it, I cleaned up the bathroom, then went outside to check the drain plug. As soon as I opened it, a flood came rushing in and I had to go take a shower. It was Saturday afternoon and I was wondering how expensive an emergency call would be when Beth walked past me with a suitcase in her hand. I'm going to stay with my sister until you fix this. Call me when you're done with it. I went back inside and stripped right by the back door. Screw this. I'm going to take a shower. The water might just run through the backyard. As the water washed over me, I thought about my life. Married 18 years, one daughter 17 working as a counselor at a summer camp, saving every dime for college. Thought about Beth and the growing distance between us. It seemed I was even more clueless and clumsy now than when we'd first gotten married. And sex was a thing of the past. She was only 41 years old and she was still good looking. Maybe it was a woman thing. I had read about the early onset of menopause when I was in the doctor's office last month. Maybe that's what it was. Anyway, her attitude was starting to transfer to Amy, and the pain on her face when her mother left was more than I was willing to bear. We were going to talk when she got home. I had reached my limit, and frankly, if she didn't like it, I didn't give a shit. I was tired of living in a toxic environment. After cleaning up, I decided to go to the pub, eat one of those great burgers, and maybe have a couple beers, and I would make sure that if I needed to use the restroom, I would do it there. I was coming out and saw Gus picking up his evening paper. The light bulb was on. Gus used to have a sewage treatment service. He'd still have connections, and maybe he could get someone in. I paused, and we chatted idly for a few minutes before I got to my question. He laughed. You want to save $250? Damn right I would. How? I bet the tank isn't full. I think your filter is clogged. All you gotta do is clean it out. Tell you what. I'll come by tomorrow after church and show you how to fix it. I was so happy I invited him and his wife to the pub. They spent the next two hours talking about the strange things they had pulled out of the sumps. It seems his wife, Mabel, was a dispatcher where he worked and would sometimes give him a ride if nothing was going on. One woman lost her wedding ring, and she paid to have the entire tank filtered in search of it, only to find it behind a plant on her counter. The other guy followed them to the dump. Apparently, he thought he was about to get caught and flushed $80,000 worth of cocaine down the toilet. They did find the cocaine, and he got a nice long prison sentence. The next day, they were at my place at half past two. We found the lid and pulled it. There was the filter, clear as daylight. Gus told me to watch the hose while he pulled it. He started grinning about the time it was halfway up. His wife lowered her eyes and chuckled. I found your problem, Chad. You might want to throw that in the trash from now on. I looked at what he was holding in his hands. My filter was full of condoms. Twenty-three, I found out later. I wondered stupidly how a pack of condoms had gotten into my septic system. Then I realized exactly how. There must have been something on my face because Gus and Mabel were silent for a moment. I'm sure there's an explanation, Chad. Maybe you've had visitors lately. Or maybe Amy had some friends over when you weren't there. Really, Mabel? Do you think I'll be having guests long enough for them to make it this many times? Or that my 17-year-old daughter is suddenly throwing parties? No, there's only one explanation. They spent another 45 minutes talking me down before they left. 
I waited until they left, got some thick rubber gardening gloves, and carefully collected the condoms, putting them in a triple-layer bag, then into a plastic container and putting it in the small freezer on top of my store-bought refrigerator. Then I went inside to think. Fucking bitch. A lot of things fell into place. We were done. No negotiation, no apologies. A consummated marriage. Only one thing kept me from pulling the trigger. I wanted to know who it was. I didn't bother to call Beth, let her stay where she was for a while. I needed to make a plan. I spent the rest of the day at my store. Amy needed to be picked up the next day, and I had already taken a vacation day for that. It was the first time I had seen her in seven weeks. She gave me a big hug and told me about some of the adventures she'd had arguing with 11-year-old girls who thought they were 20. Really? That young? Man, am I getting old? It wasn't until we were almost home that she asked about her mother. I told her about the septic tank. So it's already fixed? Yeah, it's already fixed. Does your mom know? No, I tried calling last night and this morning. Remember, she was supposed to be with me when I picked you up. We had a whole day of family activities planned. Amy pulled out her cell phone and called her aunt. Is mom there? No, honey, your mom's at work. Oh, good. Then why did everyone say she wasn't there when I called? Uh, 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 here's the thing. Mom better call me back from the office phone, not her cell phone, in the next 20 minutes. If not, I'll have my dad drive me to check on her. And if she blew off her own daughter over some stupid business, that little bird is going to sing to her dad. I know something. 20 minutes. 30 minutes later, she called, out of breath. Hi, honey. I'm so glad you're home. Yeah, I realized that when you came out to meet the bus. I had something come up. I can just bet. Goodbye, Mom. She called me ranting about how disrespectful she was. Well, look who taught her. It'll be tomorrow before the tank is pumped out. Amy's going to be at my parents' tonight, if you're interested. I won't. I hung up the phone and looked at Amy. She sighed. So you found out about it. What are you going to do about it? And before you get mad at me for not telling you, I found out about it at summer camp. Jenny, my best friend, had a cousin named Tony, who has a boyfriend named Jack, who lives three houses down from us. He told Tony what he saw, who told Jenny, and Jenny told me. Well, then it's straight from first-hand experience. That must be gospel. Sarcasm doesn't suit you, at least not with your daughter. I was going to tell you about it tonight. What are we going to do? You're going to graduate high school, have a senior prom. You're probably going to end up in a single-parent household. No matter how old you are, the judge will probably let you choose who you want to live with. I'll respect your decision if it's your mom. Just tell me you won't cut me out of your life. What do you think? I think you're a pretty clueless guy most of the time. Of course I'm going to choose you. I could never manipulate her the way I can manipulate you. She spent so little time with us, even in the same house, that I bet she wouldn't be able to pick me out of a crowd. But what I really need to do right now is get the taste of camp food out of my mouth. I would kill for a decent pizza or a good burger. So if you want to get to the heart of your only child, do it through my stomach. I took her to the local pizza place and watched her destroy three quarters of a large meat lover's pizza with added cheese. She leaned back in her chair, burped, and asked me what I was going to do about her mother. She acted mature and tough, but I could see the little girl in her eyes. This was going to be hard for us. I took her hand. Let me tell you, Andy, what my priorities are. First, I need to be absolutely sure I'm handling this right. In the coming months, I need to figure out how to minimize the impact of the divorce on you. Right now, you are the number one person in my life. I want you to be as safe and happy as I can make you. A lot depends on how your mother reacts. I promise you I'll do everything I can to keep you out of the center of things. But Pumpkin, if what I suspect is true, my marriage to your mother is over. It's been a surreal conversation with our daughter, but I've always asked her to be involved in important family decisions since she turned 14. Of course, some decisions she couldn't participate in, but I tried to involve her in everything else. When she was 15, we needed a car. Although Mom wanted a small sports car, she agreed with me in favor of an SUV. I ended up driving anyway, taking Tony and her friends around the neighborhood, and Beth got her little car the following year. I was the one who taught her to think before making a decision and to consider all sides before giving advice. This has benefited her by making her a born leader and confessor for her group of friends. You need to figure out how to keep house, at least until I graduate. Then give it to her if it helps you financially. I'm still going to declare, right? 
The money will be there, won't it? I hastened to assure her. Honey, there's enough money in your endowment to get you through the first three years. Even if your mother doesn't help, I'll have plenty of time to find the money to pay for your last year of schooling. I give you my solemn promise. We returned home and I left her to unpack and think. By this point, I only wanted to know two things about her mother, how soon we could get a divorce and which asshole she was sleeping with. In the end, it was pretty simple. All the high-tech gadgets you can buy online can't compare to a good old-fashioned camera trap. Well, maybe I misspoke. The camera traps I borrowed from my brother were state-of-the-art, and when activated, it took a 30-second video before moving on to taking photos. It gave you a timestamp and could be programmed to zoom in when activated. They even had audio recording, but they were usually so far away from their subjects that they picked up almost nothing. It took a little brainstorming to figure out how to hide them, but with my brother's help, I built two birdhouses, each hiding a camera. I hung one on a tree by the driveway that activated whenever someone drove up, and the other on a pole aimed directly at the front door. I didn't need to see them doing nasty things. It wouldn't have mattered anyway. She said something ingratiating about putting up birdhouses at the end of summer, and I told her it was to let them weather out so the birds would think they were a natural part of the yard. Of course, I blew a full-blown smoke. What the hell did I know about how a bird chooses a nest? She just shrugged and ignored them. Here's how it worked out. She worked for a company that had a flexible schedule, so two or three times a week she took two hours off for lunch working overtime or coming in early to get her work done. Her boyfriend must have worked there as well. She got home 30 minutes before he did, grabbed a sandwich, and threw off her clothes. He'd show up, they'd do it for about 30 minutes, then get dressed and leave. She'd go back to work and he'd kill time until he got back. Sometimes he'd stay at my house and have one or two of my beers, home-brewed beer that a friend had supplied me with. I'm surprised I hadn't noticed it sooner. Maybe Tony was right. Maybe I really was clueless. Damn childish. But when I found out, I put all but one or two of the beers away in the fridge at the store. They were old-style bottles, with ceramic caps and rubber washers, about 24 ounces full. I'd take the ones I'd left in the house, drink about a quarter of them, and fill them up with fresh urine. Then I'd give them a good shake and put them back in. I would grin like crazy when I got home and found an empty bottle on the counter. I could make him nauseous, but did I really care? About once a week, I took the lid off the septic tank and pulled out the condoms. They were busy little bees, averaging two per session. Not surprisingly, she had no enthusiasm for me. It took me three weeks of careful preparation, but everything was set up and ready to go. I wouldn't let Tony be there when it all happened. No one deserved to see a parent humiliated the way I intended. I thought about inviting the neighbors over but then changed my mind. Instead, I set up two video cameras and started filming them. Brian had an old boom box that used cassettes. I put it next to my dresser where it was barely noticeable. I tried to time it so that the boom box would go off right after they stripped naked. The tape was started, a blank tape at first until it hit the sounds I had recorded. I checked the speaker and it was loud. Boom! The sound of a shotgun blast and the crack of wood breaking. I went to Habitat and bought an old door, which I set up in the woods and shot. As soon as the shot rang out, they heard me scream. Very little of it was acting. I had a lot of pent-up rage, and I let it out. You lying whore! The shotgun went off again. I'm gonna blow his balls off! Then I'm gonna stick this shotgun in your cheating face and pull the trigger until it goes off! That's me, bitch! I bet I've seen that scene a hundred times, and I still can't help but laugh. They flew out the front door and rushed to their cars. All he was wearing was a white shirt, pants, jacket, and a tie he was holding. Later, I found his boxers on the bedroom floor. I walked around the house and headed toward him. He screamed like a girl and jumped into his car. That's when he noticed the gift I had left him. I took two 20-liter buckets, dipped about 15 liters of septic fluid and a few solids into each condom, and divided the condoms equally. Just before the tape recorder went off inside, I put them in the driver's seat. Kudos to that dumbass for leaving his car unlocked in an unfamiliar neighborhood. Didn't stop me from kicking his ass anyway. Beth came running out screaming. She was wearing a white blouse that she was trying to fit into. Her naked breasts were bouncing wildly. At the same time, she was trying to pull up her brown skirt. 
Obviously, I got to them before they got down to business, or he hadn't bothered to take them off, but she was wearing a white thong. I'd never seen her in a thong before. Filling her car with condoms wasn't difficult. She rigorously locked her car, even at home. But I had a key. She fiddled with her keys as I headed toward her before I realized the door wasn't locked. She jumped in, opening the door, and tried to start the engine. It took about 15 seconds for it to get to her. Her skirt was still up and her white thong was no longer white. I stood there snapping pictures and laughing uncontrollably. I think it had gotten to her what I had done. She screamed at me, struggling to get out of the car. I slammed the door shut, nearly hitting her leg. Don't even think about getting your shit-covered ass outside. Better yet, keep going. I'm still taking the lid off the septic tank. I could get you inside and close the lid. You could probably last an hour or two paddling doggy style, but eventually you'd get tired and just slide underwater. Now that I know all I have to do is change the filters, it might be another 20 years before I have to pump it. By then, all that would be left of you would be a few big bones, and I doubt he'd be sucking them into his hose. The more I think about it, the more I like it. I pulled out my keychain to unlock the door. She put it in gear and backed out. She took out one neighbor's mailbox and knocked over another. She flew out of our cul-de-sac with frightening speed. Hey, I shouted, knowing she couldn't hear me. This is a 40 kilometer per hour zone. Slow your ass down. This isn't a residential area. It's a neighborhood. Okay, I was a big fan of Bill Cosby and Richard Pryor until I found out what a twisted asshole Bill was in real life and what a drug addict Richard had turned into. That line was from an old comedy album my dad had. I can't remember who exactly said it. I told Tony what I had done, leaving out a few details when she came home from school. She was shocked that her old man could do something like that, but then it impressed her. And people wonder who I inherited my personality from. It's just priceless. You're not angry about the way I treated your mother? No, you didn't hurt her physically and she kind of deserved it. I bet she'll remember this day for a long time. Now come on, you can help me pack her things and be careful. You've already gotten your revenge. So we carefully packed her clothes, cosmetics, and jewelry. When Tony found the sexy lingerie, she took a pair of scissors and cut everything in half. I guess the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Mom's not answering her phone, she told me as she walked out with the last batch. She's at Aunt Gwen's, I just talked to her. I think she owes Mom a debt of gratitude for covering up for her little adventures. It's a shame Uncle Jack found out anyway. I'll be right back. You've got her in your crosshairs right now, Dad. Maybe we should think about changing the locks tomorrow. It was three hours before she came back. Mom was just desperate. She kept saying over and over again that it wasn't meant to be. I think she's feeling some serious remorse about her choices. If you can believe it, she wants to come home. I convinced her to give you a few days to calm down. Aunt Gwen followed up by asking me if I thought you could get over it and take her back. I just smirked and got into my car. I was still in full anesthetic mode and asked to notify her at work. Gwen was supposed to come and pick her up. By hitting first, I got temporary custody. Even though I threatened to show everyone my tape, she contested the divorce and convinced the judge to schedule counseling. I was adamantly opposed, but my attorney advised me to suck it up and play along. Eight sessions. To my surprise, some of it I even liked. The woman we visited was our age, moderately attractive and well-built. I noticed she didn't have a ring. At the very first meeting, she asked us what we hoped to get out of these classes. Beth went first. I want my husband and daughter back. I want to come home and rebuild our marriage. I kept a nonchalant expression on my face. Then it was my turn. I would tell you that this is a waste of your time, Miss Turner, but it's not. Because whatever the outcome, you'll still get paid. Don't worry. I will do my best to remain calm. I will indeed participate to the best of my ability. But I wouldn't want to stay married to Beth for anything in the world. She's ruined everything and the damage is too deep. What I expect to get out of these sessions is your written opinion that this marriage is unsalvageable. So let's get started, shall we? I'm sorry you feel that way about this, Chad. I think, uh, why are you apologizing, Miss Turner? We have to be honest here. If this is how I feel and I'm okay with my decision, why should it make me sad? I think I caught her off guard. Well, I mean, I'm here to help you find your way, to talk about your difficulties and see if we can resolve them. Miss Turner, really? I'm not lost. I don't need help finding my way. My path is clear and I can see only one set of footprints on it. 
I already have my solution. As far as I am concerned, you are here to try to force me to accept an alternative that I find completely unattractive and impossible. I'm here to tell you that you're pissing into the wind, but hey, I'm paying for these sessions. I should at least get some entertainment value out of them. By all means, keep going. I got her. Chad, Mr. Jones, you know I have to report to a judge. If you don't cooperate or participate, it could work against you. Am I being uncooperative? I think I'm being very proactive. I've done most of the talking around here. And, Miss Turner, I don't respond well to threats, veiled or otherwise. That's one of the reasons I tape these sessions. I put my little tape recorder, which had been running the whole time, on the table. Mr. Jones, you have no right to tape these sessions? Why not? You can and I can't. As the person paying the bills, I'm entitled to the assurance that I'm paying my money what I deserve. I won't let you do this. Now, I stand up, taking my tape recorder. We're done here, Miss Turner. Tomorrow I'll formally request another therapist if I can get to a judge. I'm sure this tape will play an important part in his decision. I wish you a pleasant evening. I left both her and Beth with their mouths hanging open. My lawyer convinced the judge to appoint someone else, an older woman who didn't care if I taped the proceedings. It went pretty smoothly. There were many instances where Beth begged for a second chance, and I said no. The only heated conversation occurred when she tried to convince both the counselor and me that it was just a brief affair. She had overreacted. She wanted to get it over with. Blah, blah, blah. I pounced on her with my whole body. I'm not sure how timelines work in the cheater world. How long does an affair last as opposed to a full-blown, ongoing affair? Is an affair less destructive to a marriage? I know for a fact that you have had sex 41 times in at least six or seven weeks. 41 times. It wasn't an affair. Neither of you were going to stop before you got caught. Forty-one times. It took a lot of planning, a lot of coordination. It wasn't an affair, Beth. It was a carefully planned plan of action. You guys were pretty smart. It could have gone on for years if you hadn't clogged the sewer pipe. But you got caught. Pretty dramatic, I thought. I couldn't help but laugh lightly. Beth went to her sister's house, and the sister wouldn't let her on the doorstep until she had undressed and thrown her clothes in the trash. Even after five showers, she still smelled. The repairman cleaned her car, but she had to replace the driver's seat. I don't know what happened to her lover, but he went to jail about a week after Beth. I never showed anyone the video I took, but word got out. Brain heard about it and nicknamed me the condom. I think her sister leaked most of the story a few weeks later, after having a little too much to drink at a local bar. Classes were pretty boring. By the fourth week, we were just doing all the required activities. Beth was crying, and I remained stoic. The counselor announced it on the sixth session, and four months later, Beth and I were the proud owners, at least in my case, of a set of shiny new divorce decrees. It seemed to me that the agreement was quite reasonable. In lieu of child support, Beth was to pay half of the mortgage on the house and continue to contribute to Tony's college fund. There were only ten payments left, so it was pretty much a wash. As soon as Tony graduated, we sold the house and split the money. We got a good price, even with the economic downturn. I took my half and bought a house five houses away. The lot was bigger. It had an extra bedroom, and there was even a pool in the backyard, the only one in the neighborhood. It was a rush sale, and I bought it for about two-thirds of what it was actually worth. I only had to finance 20000 It was like a car loan. I paid it off in four years. Tony was doing well in college. She started bringing two of her roommates to her house over break. I'd find them summer jobs, and when they had a day off, they'd lay by the pool as little as possible. I ended up with a lot of college-aged visitors, men and women. I became something of an urban legend. Now, even at work, most people call me condom. I was a department manager in a company that made brake parts for high-end cars, mostly Mercedes and BMW, but also Bentley and Land Rover. I was earning what many shift supervisors in other factories were earning. I was good at my job, and my bosses were happy with me. I didn't even think about a relationship until Tony went into her third year of college. I didn't really want one. Oh, I'd had a few girlfriends with benefits over the years, but nothing serious. Then Colette went to work. She was asked to head up another department. We talked, mostly about work. But once a month, the managers would go to the local pub for some fresh air and relaxation. After three months, I asked her out, and she said yes. There was a spark there but we took our time with it. It took almost four months before we started to get closer. 
I felt that if she was going to be in my life, she needed to know my story, so I told her the whole story of why I got the nickname Condom. She seemed a little surprised, then had a hard time hiding a smile. Soon she was laughing. Then she told me her story. She was married, like me, to someone very much like my ex. I just stared at her with my mouth open while she looked tense. Suddenly I smirked. I think I love you, she smiled back. You should know better. After a few more months, we decided we did. Tony loved her and understood when she couldn't bring her roommates the next summer. We needed bedrooms. Colette had a 16-year-old daughter and a 14-year-old son. Tony and her daughter Joy were bridesmaids, and her son Bill was walking her down the aisle. It was several months before we settled into the family apartment. When the time came, Tony showed the joy of graduating at her old campus, and two years later, Bill received a tennis scholarship. We are a few years older now. The kids came here for our 15th wedding anniversary. Tony is married and has two children. Joy has three children, and Bill brought her husband and adopted daughter. The grandkids were splashing around in the pool. The kids were watching them and cooking. We just sat there like honored guests. From where I was sitting, I could see a small piece of jewelry on the fence. Colette was quite a talented artist, and she painted accents on our mailboxes, birdhouses, and fences. The one I was looking at was so tiny it was barely noticeable, an inflated condom with poison ivy curling around it. A reminder, she said, we never needed it. As for what happened to Beth, who the hell cares?